Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar from ASEAN Center for Energy. ASEAN Center for Energy would like to conduct our, our fifth webinar 2018 on the title of ASEAN Pathways to Paris Agreements. Before we start the webinar, I would like to introduce myself as a moderator. My name is Muhammad Siddiq. I am a technical officer under the ASEAN German Energy Programs. Before start to the webinar, I will give short introductions about the ASEAN Center for Energy itself. ASEAN Center for Energy has three roles in ASEAN member state. We serve as a think tank, second energy data analysis hub, and the third one as a catalyst. In the think tank, we identifying and surfacing innovative solutions. Then for then for the energy data and knowledge hub, we provide a knowledge depository for ASEAN member states. And for the catalyst, we unify and strengthen ASEAN energy cooperation and integrations. Now, in the short introductions about, about the webinars that this is the uh, fifth webinar on 2018 on the title of ASEAN Pathways to Paris Agreements. Our target audience are energy regulators, policy makers on energy sectors, energy researchers, academia, and the private sectors. The webinar will be conducted about an hour starting at 9 until 10 a.m. at Jakarta time. The outcomes that we expected from the webinar that we encourage discussion on energy sector and Paris Agreement for ASEAN, also for information exchange among us, and the third is multi stakeholders discussion platform. The agenda of the webinar will be short sort of introductions and uh, introduction about ASEAN Center Energy itself, then continue uh, to the presenter from the three speakers. For this, for the first speakers, we will have Ms. Badaria Yosiana from ASEAN Center for Energy. She will deliver on energy and climate change in Asia. And the second from the MIT set, uh, there will be Dr. Sergi Pasev. He will be delivered on an update on the MIT General Electric and ICE study on the ASEAN pathways to reaching the goals of the Paris Agreements. The third speakers will be from the National University of Singapore. There is Miss Melissa Lau. She will uh, deliver on the significance of MRV in driving a low carbon feature in ASEAN countries. After the uh, <clears throat> three presentation of those speakers, there will be the Q&A or discussion session around 10 to 15 minutes. Now I would like to introduce you about our speakers. For the first speakers, is the Miss Yosiana. She currently acts as the manager for the ASEAN German Energy Program or AGEP, which is a joint cooperation program with the GIZ with the objective to improve regional cooperation in renewable and EENC field in the ASEAN region. Prior to ICE, Miss Yosiana worked with Japan International Cooperation Agency or JICA on the climate change project in Indonesia. Her interests are among others renewable energy and EENC, climate change, sustainable development, and climate financing. The second speaker is Dr. Sergi Palsev. He is a deputy director of the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change and a senior research scientist at MIT Energy Initiative and MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research at Massachusetts Institute of the Technology, Cambridge, USA. Before joining MIT in 2002, 
Dr. Sergi Palsev worked as a con as a consultant for International Management and Communication Corporation and the World Bank. And she was also served as an executive director of the program in economics and management of the technology at Belarusian State University. He received a diploma in radio physics and electronics from Belar Belarusian State University and PhD in economics from the University of Colorado at Boulder. The third speaker is Ms. Melissa Lowe. She is a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute, National University of Singapore. Melissa was awarded the Shell Best Dissertation Award 2013. She has participated in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or UNFCCC Conference of Parties COP Talks since December 2009. And she is the designated contact point for the NUS accreditation to the UNFCCC. Her current research areas areas are on the implications of the Paris Agreement and countries' progress in meeting their climate pledge. Melissa recently served as a PhD student program chair for the 4th International Association of Energy Economics Conference held in the Singapore from 18 to 20 June 2017. That is not introductions about the ASEAN Center for Energy and our agenda and also short biography of the speakers. Now we will move to the first presentation will be delivered by Ms. Badaria Yusiana. Ms. Badaria Yusiana, time is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to uh, our uh, panelists, uh, Ms. Melissa and Dr. Shai. Good evening um, in Boston. So today I would like to give you a very brief introduction about uh, in ASEAN. Uh, let please wait. I will share my presentation very soon. Okay. Uh, now it's okay. Can you? I believe yeah. yes. Okay, so uh, I think I'll if you could see my slide, um, then I'll start with my presentation. Um, four of the world uh, countries that is most affected by climate change are located in Southeast Asia. And as you can see um, in the figure, that the climate vulnerability index classifies the regions, population and ecosystems are either highly, I think most of the Southeast um, Asia countries are very uh, vulnerable, vulnerable to the climate change. And why it's um, is vulnerable to climate change 
much. Um, there are several reasons, and uh, mostly are because our population and economic activity of and only re um, reliant on agricultural uh, for livelihoods. And also, we are very high dependence on natural resources and forestry, and with uh, quite high increasing energy demand. And of course, there are still um, in, in several um, ASEAN member states, we are uh, still facing the extreme poverty, uh, which is uh, remains high. And the ADB study in 2009, um, it projects that there will be uh, around 4.8 degree of Celsius rise in mean annual temperature and around 70 centimeters rise in mean sea level by 2100 in Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. And also the projections of economic losses include a decline up to 50% of the rise yield potential by 2000 and a loss of 6.7% of combined GDP each year by 2100. So it's the ASEAN countries are, are, are very uh, vulnerable to the climate change effect. And to see this uh, situation, the ASEAN leaders at the regional level, they have issued a declarations or statements relate, related to climate change at their 2007, 2009, 2010, 2011, and, the la and, and latest in 2014 uh, joint statement on climate change, as you can see in the screen will um as shown in the screen and through this statement the asean leaders express um the common understanding and position uh, and there are also their aspirations towards a global solution to the to the challenge of climate change and their resolve to achieve the asean community rest to climate change through national and regional actions. And all the 10 into NDCs. And as you can see in the screen, this is NDCs sectors. And um, so at the regional level, the ASEAN itself, uh, we, don't have, we have the blueprint called the ASEAN Plan of Action on Energy Cooperations. Um, it's a five years blueprint. And with the current one in 2016, 2025, uh, the phase one until 2022, uh, the, 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 the actions is leading to a significant CO2 emissions reduction in the region. So as, as for your information, the ASEAN has a target to achieve a 23% of renewable energy in their total primary energy supply. And as I mentioned in my previous slide that the energy demand here in the region is still very much um, growing significantly. In 2015, the total primary energy supply in the region was around 627 uh, MTOE. And um, we just published our fifth ASEAN energy outlook last year try to make a projection how the energy sector will look like in the region. Primary energy supply, we reach around 1,450 MTOE. It's um, equal to 3.4% of the annual growth, and it's uh, highly above the world average growth. And as you can see here, the fossil fuel is pretty much domin dominating the energy sector. So in, in 2015, Uh, the fossil fuel share in, in the total primary energy supply is around 40, uh, 46%. Um, and, and then we predict that in 2040, the, the dominance of the fossil fuel will pretty much uh, remain the same scenario. In the projection period, with um, annual growth of 4%. And in uh, the um, with IRENA uh, outlook, 
how is the you know, we look like in 25 whether as the uh, that we have the sectors the emission will create will increase very much uh, with the um uh, in 2020 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, significant increase around 73 percent and as I, as you can see also um the fossil fuel especially coal will be very much um very very high and the increase is almost 100 percent and oil is 32 percent and the gas is 66 percent so the um, co2 emissions from the energy it will two gigaton per year by 2025 and as i mentioned before that coal will be the largest source of energy related co2 emission by 2025 okay and also we try to uh, uh, make a prediction the emission will be emission will be will looks like in 2040 so the uh, please note that the emissions in this outlook river only to the uh, to the result from all types of energy conversions processes in power sectors um as well as residential commercial industrial agricultural and transport sectors it does not include the um the potential emissions from the land use change and waste processing so as you can see that um um in 2040 under the b EU, the emission projection from energy sector will reach around 3,500 um, million ton of CO2 equivalent. And under the um, um, APS scenarios, uh, we could somehow reduce the emissions to 2,000 uh, around 2,100 million ton CO2 equivalent by uh, implementing the renewable energy and energy efficiency um, initiatives. And we also try to make a projection um, on the emission intensity, CO2 emissions per, per GDP. And it is shown that even with a progressive plan, it is still quite difficult for the region to reduce the future levels of energy related CO2 emissions to the 2014 level or even lower. And however, as I mentioned that we in the ASEAN has, um, has um has a set actions on in renewable energy and energy efficiency um the per capita emission will still increase however the emission intensity uh, under the APS scenario is continuously reducing and this is the emissions per capita will looks like in 2040 so um under the BAU scenarios our emissions per capita will increase almost two times what we have right now but under the uh, APS scenarios it will increase to only 1.2 uh, times in what uh, 2015 level so this will be my last slide so how the ASEAN could you know um work together combating the climate change by enhancing cooperations to improve uh, the ASEAN's collective to address the climate change by having an adaptation and mitigation actions and also by increasing the competent the competence and awareness in climate change and of course in technology and development um, transfer and also the true financing uh, um, such as Green Climate Fund, REDD Plus, and Adaptation Fund, and others um, financing mechanism, and also by carefully calculating the potential loss and damage that climate change uh, issues and with ACE, GE, and MIT on the um, ASEAN pathway to Paris Agreement. So that will be my uh, presentations. Thank you, Sidik. Thank you, Ms. Yosiana, for your presentation. Now we move to second speaker from the MIT, the, uh, Dr. Sergi Paksnell. Hello? Yeah, Dr. Sergi, okay. time is... Hello, okay. yeah, time yep. is yours. Can, can you hear me well? We can hear you well. 
Great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, our uh, update on uh, the study, which uh, we are doing jointly with ACE and GE. We are trying to understand uh, what are the technology options and policy options for ASEAN uh, in order to uh, meet uh, their uh, stated goals for the Paris Agreement. A uh, couple of the things uh, which I want to mention. Well, first of all, uh, I think I'm going to see the slides with some delay, and uh, if uh, you're on a, if I'm seeing the wrong slide, just let me know. But hopefully we, we can manage that. So I'll ask Shidi to uh, advance the slides, and uh, I'll try uh, to go uh, over all of them. Uh, uh, very, very briefly. So I'm going to have 20 slides and 15 minutes for my presentation. Uh, but at the end, uh, you will have chance to ask questions. So please forward them to uh, Shidik and he will be uh, doing uh, the Q&A session. And those questions which we won't be able to answer, I'll be more than happy to address later on. So Shidik, can you uh, move to the second slide? Okay, now I'm seeing the second slide, and uh, one may ask, well, why MIT, which is far, far away, uh, is trying to do uh, the analysis, and the answer is very simple, because uh, the ASEAN region is extremely important uh, for reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement, and you can see that uh, it's a substantial uh, proportion, both in terms of population and economic activity and greenhouse gases. I also would like to uh, take uh, you to uh, the uh, uh, circle which is on the lower right corner. So you see that circle in green, uh, blue, and reddish color, which uh, represents uh, the important feature uh, of the ASEAN uh, region. Well, one feature is a lot of emissions from the region are coming from the land use change component. And those emissions are uh, much more uncertain and uh, they are difficult to quantify. And later on, uh, I'll uh, talk just very, very briefly. No, can you, can you, yes, yeah, still keep this slide. So uh, I'll, I'll return to that very, very briefly. Uh, but uh, one point which we are, uh, are making in our report is that we are going to focus for initial reduction on energy and uh, other emissions. And so you see that uh, another point is energy is quite important, but still it's not uh, the whole emissions. So other emissions from other sectors and other gases uh, also contribute to substantial uh, portion uh, towards what uh, what is the potential for the mitigation. And later on, when I'm going to show you very illustrative result uh, about uh, switching from coal to other sources of energy, well, you will see that that switch, which is related to energy, is still going to limit uh, the potential how much reduction we can make into the future. So next slide, please. So this slide, uh, in a nutshell, shows a similar picture uh, which uh, Yossiana uh, presented in terms of the energy-related emissions. So this time, we uh, put on this graph our estimate where uh, the countries uh, in aggregate are going in terms of the emissions in the baseline. And then we have uh, tried to estimate what is the reduction in terms of conditional and unconditional? And uh, I'll explain what's the difference. So most of you would know, but I'll explain a little bit more what those two reductions mean. And you see that, well, for the region uh, uh, as an aggregate, there is a still substantial uh, gap which need to be uh, mitigated in order to reach the stated goal for the Paris Agreement. And in our report, we are making the point that numerous policy options and technology options are available to close this particular gap. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay, now I see the slide. So, uh, what what is our report? What is the goal? What are we trying to do uh, in this write-up? We are trying to assess the policy and technology pathways, how to meet the stated goals of the uh, Paris Agreement. We are trying to do country by country for all 10 countries uh, to understand what do we understand about the current emission trajectory and the targets which countries uh, need to be uh, on. We also provide a section on the lessons learned in other regions. So when we are talking uh, about the policy instruments to uh, achieve these goals, well, we are looking at the experience how successful other countries have been in order to apply, in, in, when they apply uh, these policy instruments in order to uh, reduce emissions. In addition to the uh, gap analysis for all 10 countries, we have developed two uh, economy-wide models for selected countries, in this particular case for Indonesia and Vietnam, which allows us to understand, well, what is the overall cost of the policy and what is the overall cost of alternative policies. And we also try to understand, well, is there an interest for detailed analysis of other countries of the region? So for this particular project, we had the budget and time to do only two countries. And well, we are trying to understand, well, is there a need for similar type of the analysis for other countries, for other projects? And so the whole idea is try to provide the recommendations, what the policy instruments the countries can take, and what are the technology pathways countries can take. So next slide, please. So the report approach, uh, we are trying to, uh, no, go back to one slide, slide five. Thank you. So the report approach uh, is to have interactions uh, with the main key uh, stakeholders. Uh, so we already had our uh, workshop uh, in Manila in September, where uh, we try to uh, tell this is what we are going to do. And so we are hoping to keep this dialogue. And so we are very fortunate for the cooperation with ACE, which provides us uh, enormous help in terms of understanding and interpreting the data uh, from the ASEAN region. And we are also coordinating with GE because they are technology leader uh, in the provision of uh, the low carbon options. And we try to understand well, what is the reality? And much more importantly, what are the future options for the technology which might be available for these countries? So uh, I'm hoping to use this opportunity to uh, make you aware of this activity. The report, uh, the final report uh, is going to be uh, due uh, in November of this year. And so we hope that, well, between now, uh, which is mid-May, and in the upcoming months, uh, we will uh, be uh, happy to see what is your reaction to our initial draft and what is your reaction uh, and where uh, you see that we didn't depict uh, your particular countries uh, in the right way and where you see uh, we uh, got something incorrectly. So we are happy to interact with you and uh, get your inputs uh, to our initial analysis. Because after all, you know the country is much better than we are. We have some expertise, but we are hoping to uh, get uh, the expertise from you as well. And so we already have done numerous policy and technology studies in many, many countries in the world. So this time uh, we are expanding uh, our uh, expertise uh, to the ASEAN countries. And I already told that we are going to do the gap analysis for all 10 countries and uh, the deep dive into the selected countries. And we are really hopeful for a good, uh, good uh, uh, feedback to our initial draft from you. Next slide, please. So these, uh, this is the report outline. These are the chapters of the report. So uh, the, we have a section where uh, we are telling what are the pledges or, uh, and our understanding of the pledges. Then we are providing a section on the projected emission profiles on the aggregate. Then we are talking uh, about the policy and technology options uh, to reduce emissions. Again, that section is more on the aggregate level where we are making some references uh, to the experiences and providing uh, some uh, evaluation of these policy and technology options. 
Then we have a section of where we are providing the country level uh, assessment uh, for all 10 countries with a focus on energy, on electricity, the resulting emissions, and our understanding of the current policy and measures. So this is the section which uh, we hope to get uh, most of uh, uh, the feedback from you, uh, how well we uh, have depicted uh, uh, our analysis and our projections. Then it's going to be another section on economy-wide analysis for Indonesia and Vietnam. And we're also going to have a section on detailed experiences in other regions uh, with trying to reduce emissions. Next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, the summary of the pledges. Uh, as you uh, can see, and uh, well, most of you are uh, very familiar with this, uh, that the pledges in ASEAN countries are very heterogeneous. So some of the pledges uh, are relative to business as usual, or BAU. Some of the pledges are in terms of emission intensity. Some of the pledges in terms of energy intensity. And also, as I have mentioned, there is a distinction between unconditional pledges, so the countries which are promising that this is what they will try to do, uh, regardless of what other countries are doing, and there are conditional pledges, which are based on the conditions of certain either financial or technological help or uh, more uh, involved participation from the other countries. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing the next slide. So can we go to slide eight? Okay, so this is a summary uh, of uh, our uh, assessment. What are the baseline emissions? So uh, the column on your left shows you the baseline emission by country. And the description of the target you remember some of the countries are providing the targets for land use change emissions. So we are moving that into separate category. So these are the targets which are related to non-land use activities. And you can see the percent reductions in conditional and unconditional and the emission gap. So uh, you already have seen uh, on the graph which uh, uh, was at the beginning of the presentation that the resulting gap for unconditional uh, targets is about 11%, and the gap for conditional targets is about 24% from business as usual. So next slide, please. So what we have done, uh, what, what you see uh, on slide nine uh, is uh, the projection, some historical data and projection, both for primary energy use and electricity. So in this particular case, this is aggregate number for ASEAN. We also have a similar graphs for every country in the region. So we have 10 of these for every country. I'm not going to show them during this presentation, but if you're interested in providing the comments, let me know and we can share it with you and look at every particular country. So the overall uh, uh, story from this particular <clears throat> slide shows that the growth in power generation is in the region is going to be substantial and the growth in the wind and solar is going to be the fastest. So you have five-fold increase from 2015 to 2030. But you see that it starts from a very low base of so this huge increase still shows that the system is going to continue to rely on fossil fuels. And so they need some technologies and policies to make sure that uh, if there is additional actions in terms of the emission mitigation. Next slide, please. So the slide 10 shows similar information, but now uh, it is divided by country. So you can see what is the contribution of every country in the ASEAN region uh, in terms of the primary energy and electricity and how we project their growth into the future. And you see that we project that uh, it's going to be increasing primary energy and electricity for all ASEAN countries. And so this is one of the fastest 
fastest growth region uh, in the world. And as a result, it's very important to uh, make sure that the countries understand the implications of making uh, sure that the countries are still growing and developing economically and meeting their emission mitigation targets. Next slide, please. So slide 11 shows you uh, the uh, policy categories and policy instruments in each category. So what we are doing in the report, we are describing uh, these uh, policy instruments which country can employ and we describe the shortcomings and benefits of using these particular instruments. Again, at this point, we are di discussing that in general terms, which are applicable to all countries, and we are making some suggestions which tools would be applicable to the countries with different levels uh, of their advancement of their uh, administrative and technological capacities. And so then in the next slide, so next slide, please. In the next slide, uh, we are uh, providing well how we are evaluating uh, these uh, instruments in terms of the uh, criteria, so how effective in terms of the environmental goals, how effective in terms of the cost goals, what are the distributional considerations of these tools, and what is institutional feasibility. We provide from, based on our experience, the recommendations what you should be doing and should not be doing if you choose these particular policy instruments and we provide uh, some justification from international experience what, uh, uh, what are the implications uh, of applying uh, these instruments. So next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of some of the policy options uh, uh, and our recommendations. And as uh, we uh, have noted in the report, uh, there is uh, a wide variety uh, uh, of uh, the countries in terms of their national administrative and technical capacities. And so based on all these considerations, countries may see where they fit and what instruments fit better uh, to their particular uh, situation. And so our general uh, argument is that for countries with more advanced uh, capacities, we recommend something which of the higher efficiency but requires again, more advanced uh, 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 capacity in terms of put uh, that instrument into the place. So we have shown and referenced many studies that this is the best possible way how to achieve uh, emission mitigation, but uh, it's a little bit more challenging uh, for the countries to start with that. So for the countries which are still in the process of advanc advancing the institutional capacity, we recommend other uh, uh, policy options uh, such as renewable portfolio standards, renewable energy auctions, feed-in tariffs, to start the process of the reduction and then move to more advanced uh, policy instruments uh, which are going to help them to reach their targets. Another important uh, story which we also uh, recommend strongly is that you start with certain pilot programs in order to fine-tune policy design, prepare uh, the participants, industry and uh, policy makers uh, and make sure that you have a verification and compliance story uh, in place and then provide a certainty. So provide a certainty with imposing the policy for some longer period of time, but again, make sure that you have place to adjust uh, these uh, targets into the future. Next slide, please. So can we move to slide 14? I still, I still see slide 13. Okay, so slide 14. So uh, in terms of the technology options, there is a variety, wide variety of options which are available, uh, including moving to low carbon uh, options like wind and solar, uh, including moving more to geothermal where geographically uh, available. Uh, also, we stress that, well, you shouldn't forget about the uh, options to make uh, energy efficiency improvements in traditional generation. And so we provide uh, certain uh, calculations which shows how much uh, uh, gain you might get from making your generation fleet more efficient. 
But the most important thing which we stress is that the government should not pick a winner in terms of the technology. Almost for sure, that is going to be a wrong choice. So what we are telling, well, you need to create the policy situation which is going to incentivize the emission reduction for all sources. So don't pick the winner. Don't be, think that it's going to be some technology like wind or solar or carbon capture because, well, almost certainly you need to make, you will make uh, some adjustment because new information about the cost and efficiency is going to the place. And so you need to keep some flexibility in order to move that forward. So uh, also make sure that uh, the market design and technology allow for demand side management. It's not only supply side, which is important, demand side is equally important. And we stress that point. And another point is, well, you need to understand, well, what is the scale of required transformation? And so I'm going to illustrate with one very simple example on the next slide. And uh, which also will uh, uh, illustrate the uh, bullet point that the action in just power generation sector is not going to be sufficient to meet uh, very stringent goals. So next slide, please. So what we have done here, uh, we provide a very illustrative example. What if you are going to replace all coal generation fleet in ASEAN with a particular technology? Just to make sure that I'm making this point clear, we are not arguing to do that because, well, that's not going to be economic and that's not going to be economically efficient. So this calculation is only for illustrative purposes to show you what is the scale of the needed transformation in energy sector in order to meet the stated goals. And you can see that even if you convert all coal generation to wind, if you are removing the uh, carbon emit technology to no carbon emitting technology it's still not enough to meet the conditional goal because remember from the first slide it's not only about the energy it's not only uh, about the uh, power sector it's uh, other emissions which are also uh, need to be mitigated so this provide you the level of the transformation uh, for the current uh, goals well one may argue that the future goals after the first NDCs might be even more stringent. So those of you who are in charge of thinking for the long-term strategy for your power generation sector should be thinking hard, okay, well, what is the strategy which is not going to let me meet the targets for the next 15 years or next 10 years, but because the fleet is going to be uh, in place for a longer term, for 20, 30, 40 years, is the decision other decisions which you are making today are going to be compatible with even more stringent targets into the future next slide please so this slide again uh you are not going to see many uh, of the numbers and that's on purpose well i try to fit all 10 graphs for 10 countries but again uh it's uh, i will refer to the report uh, to look at, at the particular countries. So we have this uh, type of the uh, estimates both for energy, for electricity, and the resulting emissions. And we are comparing our understanding where the countries are going in terms of the emissions and what is, uh, what is the required reduction. This the official projections where those official projections are available. So you can see in this red color or reddish color, I'm not sure how you see it on your screens, uh, I see them as a kind of rose or pinkish colors. Here, uh, where uh, you see uh, the official uh, BAU projections which we got uh, from uh, the NDCs of a particular countries and how uh, our understanding uh, is uh, co compared to these. So again, uh, the whole hope uh, that you're going to take a look at the countries of your interest and uh, you can tell us, uh, well, your views and we can compare the notes, what is driving our results uh, with what you think uh, where the countries are going to uh, go in terms of meeting the targets. Next slide, please. Uh, we also, as I have mentioned, have done the uh, deep dive uh, what we call 
uh, the kind of more, uh, more, uh, more, more uh, detailed analysis of the countries. Uh, in this particular case, Vietnam and Indonesia, where we run several scenarios. Uh, what is the cost of meeting particular targets? So the next slide. So the next slide provides some summary from these deep dive insights. So what we are trying to evaluate, well, what is the cost for GDP? What is the welfare cost of different policies? And what we can do with our detailed model, well, we can take a look what is the impact on the outputs of particular sectors? What if you are going to cover the whole economy? What if you are going to cover part of the economy? And so how these uh, reaching uh, these different policy scenarios is going to affect uh, both the production of electricity, primary energy, output of different sectors, and ultimately what is the GDP cost of going in these directions. And we also try to understand, well, what if you are going to put more energy efficient measures and use the digital technology uh, in order to pursue the development and climate policy goals and we evaluate what would be the potential gain of uh, going that way and how much benefits you're going to get from there. Next slide, please. Uh, can we move to slide 19? Yeah, so then uh, this is a summary of the lessons learned from other regions. And so, uh, again, uh, what we are stressing that, well, you shouldn't learn from your own mistakes, you'd better learn from somebody else's mistakes. And so we have the uh, a large section where we evaluate uh, the successes and uh, shortcomings, how uh, different policies were introduced in different parts of the world. Feeding tariffs, auctions, standards, regulations, carbon pricing. And so we stress that, well, probably countries are not going to impose one particular policy. It's going to be a mix of policies. And we provide some caution that coexistence of multiple policies may result in interactions. And so those who are responsible for developing what is going to bring the country to meet the goals have to be careful how to structure the policy in order to avoid unnecessary burden in order to reduce the economic cost in order uh, to meet uh, some particular countries. So uh, next slide, please. So I think uh, I'm going to finish uh, this, this, this particular slide just to remind you that, well, this is just the first step uh, in the much deeper emission uh, mitigation needs if we really have to meet uh, the Paris Agreement goals of limiting the global temperature to less than two degrees, so to be well below two degrees, we are going to re uh, require much deeper reduction into the future. So this is a good progress, but again, you need to think that this initial reduction is just a first step. So the countries should review their policy and be prepared uh, there in terms of the energy sector, in terms of the uh, administrative capacity, how to deal with much deeper cuts, which inevitably going to come into the future. So I think that's my last slide, substantive slide. So the next slide, if you go to the next slide, that provides uh, the contact information. I'll be more than happy to address any questions. And if you're going to have any reactions, more than happy to hear. And if you're interested in providing uh, the uh, your input and feedback to our report, let us know. We will be more than happy to share it with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sergi, for your presentations. Next to the third presentation from Ms. Melissa from the NUS. Ms. Melissa, time is yours. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. So um, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah. thank you very much, uh, Shidik and the ASEAN Center for Energy for inviting me to speak uh, at this webinar today. And thank you to my two uh, panelists uh, for setting the scene and um, sharing uh, the overview of ASEAN. I think it provides uh, an excellent context for 
where I'm going with this presentation, which is to highlight the importance of measurement, reporting, and verification. Essentially, you might uh, term these three uh, concepts under transparency. Uh, I argue in this presentation uh, that this uh, transparency is very important uh, for ASEAN countries and indeed all of the countries who have uh, signed and ratified the Paris Agreement uh, in order to meet those uh, nationally determined uh, contributions. So without further ado, I will begin. So just to give an overview of what measurement, reporting and verification is under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, these are essentially broken down into two main reporting formats. Uh, there are other aspects, of course, that one might consider under MRV. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about domestic MRV systems here. I'm talking about the uh, institutionalized, multilaterally agreed forms of uh, communications that parties submit to the UN uh, under various uh, agreed guidelines and rules. So you see in this slide, national communications are prepared once every four years, and I won't go into detail on how and when they were adopted. These are all very clearly um, spelled out in the slides. But more recently, I will, uh, and what I will be, be focusing on today are the biennial update reports. And these are very much more recent uh, reports, requirements uh, required by non-NX1 parties or parties not NX1. Uh, parties who are not uh, in NX1, so developing country parties, which include all of the ASEAN uh, country member states. Uh, and I'll be focusing on these reports for this presentation. So again, just establishing a timeline of the various MRV uh, requirements uh, through the years. And this is uh, recorded in the UNFCCC handbook on MRV for developing countries. And you can download this quite easily on off the UNFCCC website. Key elements of the MRB framework, again, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, you see here national communications playing a very important role and the biennial update reports. What, I, what isn't mentioned here, of course, this comes from the handbook for MRV for developing countries, is the process for developed countries. So we'll just put that aside right now because we're talking about ASEAN, uh, but for developed country parties, they have a separate, although related, uh, linked uh, set of rules. Uh, right now, we're just talking about the, the reporting requirements for uh, developing countries. So national communications, uh, as I said, once every four years, and uh, oftentimes there is uh, financial support for national communication preparation. Uh, and you can track the communications because they're all posted on the UN uh, Framework communication, uh, Convention on Climate Change website. Uh, so most of the ASEAN countries, if I'm not mistaken, Brunei has very recently submitted not one, but two national communication uh, uh, in 2016 and 2017. So all of the 10, uh, if I'm not mistaken, have submitted their national communications. And these provide a very an excellent overview of uh, parties uh, progress towards meeting whatever targets, uh, maybe their 2020 targets or the NDCs. Uh, if the N if the national communications coincide with the binary update reports, which every other year they might do that. So um, these are the elements uh, for, in, in the interest of time, I will not go through the elements, but uh, all these are quite uh, clearly stated in uh, um, relevant documents on the websites. So now, my argument here is that the binary update reports, uh, because they're so frequent every two years, and it is fairly likely, I would say, given the state of the current negotiations on the Paris Agreement work program, that uh, parts or maybe the entire process of the International Consultation and Analysis process, ICA for short, will be uh, provided for under the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Uh, I say parts of it or the entire thing, because we're not sure how things will, will play out um, in Bangkok as well as in Paris, uh, in, in Poland, my mistake, sorry. So, um, uh, I will just put here on the slides that uh, the rules pertaining to the binary update reports and the ICA process are, are fairly clear. 
um, they shall cover at a minimum an inventory calendar no more than four years, so X minus four, as it were. So in 2018 this year, uh, parties will have to submit no later than 2014 uh, data for their inventories. Uh, for the enhanced transparency framework, uh, because there's a principle of no backsliding progression, uh, parties are starting to talk about X minus three, X minus two type um, uh, inventory coverage for submissions. Uh, some are even uh, calling it uh, I think there's a there's a term for tra uh, biennial transparency reports as opposed to biennial update reports uh, right now. So uh, parties have made requests for support and and all these support that have been granted to uh, parties uh, for their biennial update reports are also typically captured in the BURs. So this also means that you can uh, quite easily track uh, whether parties have received support uh, and this also, of course has, has implications on uh, the negotiations that are ongoing right now because parties are wondering whether we should capture you know, transparency of support as um, in relation to transparency of action. So um, these are the elements of international consultation and analysis. So uh, I'll go through this very quickly here. Once a party submits its BUR, uh, as I said, once every two years, starting 20, December 2014, um, they will then it will then kickstart a process of international consultation and analysis, whereby uh, parties will be assigned a technical team of experts uh, to undergo a process of technical analysis. So this is the brown box in the middle of the screen here. Um, there are six experts that, are, uh, that comprise this team of technical experts. It's important to note that even developing country uh, experts may be assigned. Uh, I'm, uh, my understanding is that right now uh, there are at least three uh, from the consultative group of experts that are uh, fairly experienced members of uh, uh, the CGE and uh, they have experience dealing with national communications from NX1 parties and so on and they'll be assigned to a, uh, a more junior or younger team uh, uh, as it were. So uh, it's a team comprising of six experts. They un undergo this uh, process after which a summary report will be issued uh, to the party my understanding is that the, the party will then uh, go through and perhaps maybe uh, through teleconferencing, uh, video conferencing uh, with the team, uh, establish the gaps in the binary reports. And ultimately, uh, what they will do is to go um, to a subsidiary body session where they will conduct the facilitative sharing of views. And the ICA uh, principles are, are extremely clear is that it has to be conducted in a manner that is non-intrusive, non-punitive and respectful of national sovereignty uh, of the parties involved. Um, so the team of technical experts have been briefed very carefully to, to understand these principles. So, so parties, uh, in, in, in a sense, need not be uh, concerned that their policies will be taken apart or be extremely, uh, other, others will be extremely critical of them. Uh, the point is to facilitate implementation as opposed to um, being punitive and, and punishing countries for not meeting uh, their pledges or the targets that they said they, they will uh, meet. So um, again, just the timeline, I will run through this extremely quickly. Um, so the draft report uh, has to be prepared by the team of technical experts and um, uh, then is conveyed to the parties, uh, the party concerned. Uh, and then during which time before the FSV, uh, the Facilitative Sharing of Views Workshop, uh, I've, I've, I uh, forgot to mention that there will be a period of Q&A, uh, question and answer, where all party members to uh, the convention are able to submit questions to the party that's undergoing this process. Right. So this is an extremely um, uh, transparent process where the parties will receive and they will uh, have a chance to respond and the workshop is an opportunity for them to give uh, oral presentation as well as um, to clarify any further um, issues that, that others have, have brought to the table. Um, and here is also a list of uh, the chairing uh, arrangements. Uh, at any one point in time, up to five parties can participate in a three-hour session. Uh, these take some time to go through, uh, but uh, as, as uh, observers will note, all these uh, are webcasted and streamed uh, live on Skype and available at your viewing um, uh, pleasure anytime on the UNFCCC website and uh, recently on YouTube as well. 
So um, in the spirit of transparency. Uh, the last workshop that was conducted was, was just last week, uh, two weeks ago, 4th of May, and Singapore actually underwent its second uh, round of facilitative sharing of views. So um, thus far, there are 41 binary update reports, the first one that have been submitted. And um, I'm happy to say that actually five uh, ASEAN countries have submitted its, uh, their first BURs. Uh, 16 second BURs, and I've also um, put down here the most recent submissions um, for you. And um, let me just quickly skip through. Um, so I'm I'm putting up this slide because uh, I want to um, perhaps highlight to everybody that it's important to keep this process in mind as we move towards the enhanced transparency framework. All the progress that has been made under the existing arrangements is going to affect how parties, how comfortable they are with the enhanced transparency framework negotiations under Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. Um, there is a parallel but very extremely related uh, track under the UN FCCC right now, which is the consultative group of experts, uh, which, as I said before, the team of technical experts come from its terms of reference expires in 2018 and there's no conclusion just yet. Uh, it has to be done uh, before Poland. Uh, I'll point out here in this slide that, for example, you can look at breakdowns of um, the kind of questions that are received. And uh, this comes from the UNFCC Secretariat. Um, you see Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia participating very strongly uh, in the facilitative sharing of views workshop, which is great because peer-to-peer -peer, um, question and answer, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, as um, my colleague earlier, um, our first speaker, panelists explained is, is extremely important to enhance collaboration and enhance uh, capacity towards meeting our goals. And five ASEAN countries have submitted their first BRs. These are excellent reports. Um, please, please go have a look, all available online. Um, three out of the five have submitted their second BRs. And I understand that um, Malaysia and Indonesia are also working towards their next round of BUR. So, these are excellent reports um, to assess progress towards meeting um, uh, our ASEAN countries' 2020 goals as well as uh, uh, NDCs. Um, and so in the following slides, I have highlighted the key points of the technical team of experts reports. Um, and these are, these are uh, they provide a wealth of information um, in these reports because, um, uh, for example, you can, you can look at the gaps. You don't need to assess the gaps yourself necessarily. You can see what gaps six experts have come up with. Um, and this, these are all in consultation with the parties themselves. Um, and parties are expected to make improvements to their BUR, uh, the subsequent BURs, uh, based on these recommendations by the team of technical experts. As I said, all available online. Um, do have a look. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, reports and presentations, uh, wealth of information that you will, that you will get. Um, I've also highlighted here the delegation, who are they led by? So also highlighting the institutional arrangements uh, that parties uh, in uh, ASEAN have, um, you know, so, sort of trying to address transparency uh, in uh, for reporting purposes, but also in terms of uh, domestic policies and measures, how do you implement them and how do you make sure they're effective, cost effective, and so on and so forth. So again, highlighting Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia's uh, team of technical experts reports, um, which are available online and, and the videos, the links are available here as well. Um, the FSP process, as I said, parties also contributed, not just in terms of um, being, being assessed, uh, being analyzed, but they also contributed in terms of um, uh, participation uh, on the in these processes, which is uh, which is great to see, and we're observing this with great interest uh, at the Energy Studies Institute and from Singapore. So, um, just here an analysis of um, the countries that have undergone a uh, full cycle of international consultation analysis. Um, I think some of the key success factors has to be spelled out here. Um, the process was designed to be non-intrusive, non-punitive, and respectful of national sovereignty, which is important for parties, um, especially coming from the decision uh, in 2020 uh, at the Durban COP17. And then um, there's an emphasis on capacity building. <clears throat> and then 
it's fine um, to have uh, the need for support and capacity building. And that's all stated very clearly in the BURs. And uh, learning by doing is extremely important and encouraged, in fact, for these processes. Um, in conclusion, I will simply say that uh, Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN countries can and will likely continue to benefit from such peer-to-peer -peer interactions, and this will help ASEAN uh, get on the pathway to uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, achievement of its NDCs, a low-carbon future, and um, the future enhanced transparency framework is certainly key to fulfilling um, parties' obligations. So. Uh, the concern may be, uh, or some of you may be, whether the five remaining Southeast Asian countries, uh, will they be submitting their first BR? So I'll point out that Cambodia and Laos, uh, I believe, are least developed country status, LDC. So uh, as far as the, the convention uh, language goes, I think they um, have discretion over uh, when they can submit. Um, and I think we can all understand that uh, capacity uh, needs to be built in, in uh, some of these countries. Uh, Brunei, as I said, has recently submitted its first and second national communication, which is a great start. So um, I would encourage everybody to have a look at that. It would also be useful to see how initiatives like the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, CIBIT, can help uh, build capacity uh, both pre and post 2020. Uh, as I said here, donors have pledged uh, 60 million uh, to the CBIT and it'll be disseminated uh, very shortly. So uh, finally, I'll say that um, acceptability of existing transparency process, uh, this process, the ICA is growing, but uh, we'll have to see because the time frame for agreeing on the enhanced transparency framework is extremely short um, and the next steps for the consultative group of experts is also um, currently being negotiated. So we'll see and um, I hope to, to stay in touch with all of you. If you have comments on this presentation, have questions for me, please uh, feel free to, to contact me. Um, and uh, here are some references from papers that uh, policy briefs that we have written on transparency as well. And the last slide is where my contact details are. And thank you so much to ASEAN Center for Energy as well. All right, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, for the next session is Q&A. We receive uh, several questions for the attendees or the participants, but due to uh, time limitations, we only selected uh, some questions to be delivered and directly answered by the speakers. But for the rest of the questions, uh, we will sum up and we will uh, try to answer to the email and put on the report of the webinar. Here are the first uh, questions coming from Sela Ramadhani Chahputri. Maybe it is, the question is delivered to Dr. Sergi to MIT. <clears throat> she asked about, uh, in the report, you mentioned that there is the selected countries which is indonesia and vietnam the question is what are the parameters to select indonesia and vietnam and why you select only for indonesia and vietnam well this is a very great question and uh, the uh, the choice of the countries uh, were made uh, in a joint consultation uh, between ge and uh, our experts and the available data and interests uh, from the respective countries. So as I have mentioned, uh, uh, at this point, we are, uh, we are looking if there is an interest uh, to uh, enhance that to other countries. Uh, well, as any project, uh, well, these projects has a certain uh, time horizon uh, the results of these projects uh, are going to be presented at the COP24. So as a result, we weren't able uh, to do the detailed look in all 10 countries. So we had to make a choice uh, on some particular countries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if uh, there is substantial interest and is substantial funding to do the analysis, uh, we are more than happy to uh, explore the potential for uh, other uh, countries uh, in order to give a deep uh, dive. Again, uh, we have done the gap analysis for all 10, so we are making a projection on the uh, 
basis uh, of our approach how to uh, project uh, the uh, primary energy and electricity uh, but uh, obviously the more detailed uh, uh, study uh, is uh, is uh, is much more beneficial and uh, one particular uh, benefit of this that we actually providing uh, the code of the models for Indonesia and Vietnam to all interested participants and well again just the code is not going to help you but we if if needed we can follow up uh, on that story so again uh, the choice was made uh, uh, jointly uh, by the participants of this uh, study Hello, Ms. Melissa. Yes. Yeah, there is a yeah, there is a question coming to you. Okay, great. From uh, yeah, from Ms. Dina Yahya. Okay. Mm -hmm. How different will the MRV process be once the Paris Agreement work program is adopted? Uh, how how different will it be? Uh, it's very hard to say right now because the negotiations on the uh, APA Agenda Item 5 are still ongoing. Uh, at the last bond session uh, that we just came out of, um, the parties agreed on a 68-page document, on uh, the, so the part on transparency uh, for the rule book, uh, the Paris rule book. So it's inconclusive at this stage, and I, I think it's important not to prejudge what what will come out of it uh, and that's what parties keep repeating as well at the talks so i can't say for sure but it's very likely that some elements of the existing arrangements will make its way into the rule book because that's the only realistic way um, that parties will be able to uh, progress from this style of transparency onwards I, I think it was it was it's good that parties are uh, receptive to the existing arrangements uh, china and india both very uh, big countries, big emitters uh, have already uh, submitted their first BURs and done their first round of facilitated sharing of views. So that's uh, very good news for all of us uh, watching transparency because uh, it means that these parties are on board. So when you have these parties on board, uh, uh, then the process can can move forward. It's realistic. You know, parties have undergone it. They're not as uh, afraid as they were before uh, before doing the the process. So uh, I think we we should remain hopeful that the process uh, will continue uh, evolving. And uh, so so we'll wait and see. But I think uh, after Bangkok, which is in uh, September, first week of September, we should have a better perhaps a better sense of 
uh, what the, the next enhanced transparency framework will look like. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Melissa. The other questions are also coming from Ms. Dinaya here, yeah? but this is a, a delivered to Dr. Sarji. Ms. Dina would like to ask about also regarding to the study. The question is, uh, as far as greenhouse gases counting is concerned, does this study only focus on the gross emissions? How about the net emission after taking into account the removals? Uh, yeah, so uh, we, indeed, uh, we in this study, we are focusing uh, on the energy related and industrial emissions uh, without taking into the account what is happening in the land use change emissions. And so for some countries, that's a very important consideration. So many countries, for example, Indonesia uh, put a substantial reduction, uh, which is going to be coming from uh, change in the land use emissions. Uh, at this point, in this report, uh, we are not exploring that. Again, in the program, we have a lot of experience how to do that and a lot of tools how to do that. But that's uh, another a very involved project, even to quantify and agree what those emissions are. Uh, I think we are providing some, uh, some uh, comparison of these emissions from different sources. And uh, one uh, good aspect about this report, at least we hope a good aspect, we are going to attach uh, all the available historic data where we are going to show uh, where uh, the uh, different sources agree on certain emissions and where the different sources disagree on the level of the emissions. And so the sinks of the uh, land use related emissions, somewhere it sinks, somewhere it's actually big sources. Uh, those where it's a lot of disagreement between the parties. And if you look at different uh, databases, you will discover that sometimes it's order of magnitude of difference. So we decided that we don't know those for sure with certainty, and we focused on those where we have a little bit more information and uh, more certainty about the level of emissions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sergi. Uh, since we received a lot of uh, questions, but uh, the time is limited, us uh, this is only one last question. To every to all of the speakers, there is a question from the Aliyah Abdullah. He asks about in a NDC of the each countries. There is a conditional and unconditional target. Could you explain the differences between conditional and unconditional target? Maybe one of the speaker could answer this question. Uh, this is Sergey. I can take very briefly on that, and uh, maybe other speakers uh, can uh, also chime in. Uh, the difference is very simple. Unconditional target is what country said that they are going to do regardless of actions from other countries. So in other words, no matter what uh, other countries are doing, this is the goal for a country to achieve. The conditional target, and so, well, there are a couple of examples which are taken on very, very aggressive conditional targets, are based on the condition that the country is going to, uh, uh, going to receive either financial support, or technological support, or that target is based that the overall ambition from all countries is going to be much higher. So that's the key difference, that if somebody else is going to do something else, then conditional on that, the country is taking on more aggressive target. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sergi. Is there any other Panelists or speakers who want to add something about the questions? Okay, if there is no more uh, either additional answer or no more <coughs> questions, let's uh, end it the Q&A sessions and move to the final session, which is the summary of the uh, our webinar today.
based on the presentation, I would like to summarize the webinar of today's sessions. Here, I would like the, to summarize that <clears throat> at regional level, ASEAN doesn't define specific value on regional commitment for the CO2 emission reductions. However, the direction of ASEAN Plan of Action on Energy Cooperation, or APAIC 2016, 2016 until 2020, is leading to a significant CO2 emission reduction in the region. Next, to, to address climate change, ASEAN should enhance cooperation to improve regional collective capacity. For example, from financing aspect, can through building a green climate fund or NDD plus and the adoption funds. Recommendation for policy and technology option for ASEAN are, are in policy options. ASEAN is recommended to have carbon pricing through taxes or quantity control, controls with tradable emission permits because they offer the greatest economic efficiency benefits. In technology options, ASEAN may apply technologies to enable efficiency improvements. The last one is ASEAN member states can and will continue to benefit from peer-to-peer -peer interactions under the existing of the future UN FTC MRP process. That's all the summary that I can sum up from the presentation of the three speakers. Lastly, I would like to thank you to the three speakers which have uh, been giving a time to deliver their thoughts and their uh, knowledge about the ASEAN Pathways to Paris Agreements. Thank you very much for the three speakers and let's call it today and see you on the, our next webinar on June 2018. Thank you very much.